from God's precious word. What a joy it is to come into your home and fellowship with you in this personal and informal manner of Bible study. Lord willing, we will be coming to you Thursday at 5 to 6 p.m. and repeated Tuesday at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. each week here on Cable 10. We invite you now to join us with your Bible, pen, and paper. Consider the words of God. Jot down important scriptures and any questions that come to mind. Most importantly, learn the Bible for yourself. And now, your Bible teacher. A wise man once said that the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. And that's precisely what we're going to talk about on this program tonight, the principle of cause and effect. My name is Steve Clark. I want to welcome you once again to the Way of Life program. For the past few weeks, you've been hearing various speakers speak about issues that are prevalent and current and appropriate to our modern day and time in which we live. Philosophies that include the denial of God, the almost religious devotion to the accumulation of material things, the denial of Jesus Christ uh, with the claim that a person can know God without him. And tonight, I'd like to bring a little bit of that into focus that just as if you were to go up and punch somebody in the nose or grab them by the nose and give it a wrench and, bring, and it would cause it to bleed, it, there are just as real effects occurring in our society as a result of very clear actions that are preceding them, cause and effect. Many people are unaware that we are now living in this country, which was established by Christian people within the last two centuries, Many people are unaware that we are living in what theologians call the post-Christian era. I'd like to address that issue tonight. I'd like to explain some of the ways you can tell that we're living in a post-Christian era, what some of the things that have brought it about, and I'd like to conclude the program, or my portion of the program this evening, by defending Christianity. I'd like to give you several reasons why Christianity is worth defending. Why Christianity is good. What are some of the things that many of us take for granted that Christianity, the belief in the Bible, the Jewish Christian scriptures, what that has caused in our society. Many people, if you were to ask them, what benefit does Christianity have in comparison to other religions in the world, are woefully ignorant of the fact that we live in a wonderful country and many of those things that we take for granted have come simply from our history, that this has been a Christian country. And today, it's very clear that we're moving away from the Christian foundation that we once had. It is a fact that our society is changing. Let me illustrate that with two examples. Recently, in southern Ontario, a senior Ontario court rejected an appeal by the Elgin County Board of Education to keep Christian religious instruction in the schools. This deprived 8,381 students from receiving Christian education. Only 245 students in that particular board area asked to be exempted. And the case against the Board of Education, which was defending Christian interests, was brought by one non-Christian family. A second example is in the realm of abortion. On November 22, 1989, the Ontario Legislature approved a bill which gives government the right to license clinics that would perform abortions if local health councils deem them necessary. These clinics could become provincial abortion chambers and abortion referral services. And we all know that under federal law, uh, abortion is now legal and widely practiced in this country. Historically, abortion and the, um, the teaching of non-Christian philosophy 
are both abhorrent to Christians. And this hasn't taken place overnight. Over the years in our country, little by little, the foundations and the props of what many people call a Christian society have been kicked out one after another. There are a number of indicators of this, a number of contrasts that you can draw to show this fact. For example, back in 1925, there was a famous trial took place down in Tennessee. It's called the Scopes Trial. A school teacher by the name of John Scopes in Dayton County in Tennessee was charged and convicted and fined by the state of Tennessee for teaching evolution, which was contrary to a law that had been passed that year, which forbade the teaching of any other um, message about origins other than the biblical view. And 42 years later, that law was repealed in the state of Tennessee, and today in the United States, it's against the law. It's absolutely illegal for anyone to teach creationism in American schools, at least the public school system. And that is why the uh, homeschool movement and the private school movements in the, the United States, for example, have mushroomed in the past decades, and they are doing the same thing in our culture north of the border. Even institutes that uh, teach um, creationism uh, or teach sciences from a creationist perspective are being threatened, for example, in California. You talk about intolerance. The tables have been completely turned in the last 50 years. Another example highlights the difference between what our countries once were and what they are today. When the pilgrims, for example, in the United States landed in Plymouth Rock in the 1700s in the United States and founded those first colonies in the New World, they were Christians. These were people that, for the most part, had been forced out of the old world for their biblical views. The Constitution that their descendants drafted in the United States provided for freedom of religion and protection from state interference in matters of conscience. And those laws and the Constitution clearly recognized the reality and the sovereignty of God over both individuals and nations. Similarly, in the colonies to the north, um, in Canada, Lower Canada and Upper Canada, and Quebec earlier than that, we know that the European immigrants that settled in Canada were Roman Catholic and Protestant. After 1760, the British, with their Protestant influence, came, and we've al always had this duality in Canadian culture. We've had what has almost universally been held to be French Catholicism as one um, historical foundation for Canadian society, and then we've also had Protestantism. Either view, either philosophy of life, um, either religion teaches the same basic, fundamental Christian values of the uh, oneness of God and the, and the deity of Jesus Christ and of salvation by faith. And yet today, uh, 200 years after the fact in the United States, 100 years uh, from Canada's independence or um, confederation, today the situation is tremendously different. Today, we have decadent ideas about God infiltrating into this country, primarily from the United States, which uh, is composed primarily of humanism. Humanism in 1933 and afterwards in 1973 was recognized by the courts in the United States as a bona fide religion. And yet humanism denies the existence of God's person, uh, denies the relevance of God, denies the sovereignty of God in human affairs. And I went through the public school system in this country, and I know just how humanist it is. I've been to university, and I know just where God is placed in university. I know where he is placed in secondary schools. You can get teaching about God, but rarely do, do you ever get the teaching about God in a positive light. Most people today are humanist. Even if they're religious, they're humanist. When you combine that philosophy of life with the tremendous influx of Eastern religion and all kinds of cults that have sprung up in the last 50 years in this country, um, when you get Hindu polytheism, which is, which is masquerading under the title New Age movement today, 
you begin to realize that this country no longer has a view of God that, it, that once was prevalent. To further illustrate, in 1871, the British North America Act assumed unlimited rights for the individual and the Dominion of Canada, except those that were expressly prohibited. The power of interpretation and amendment of the laws then rested with Parliament. The Canadian legislators continued the British tradition of ruling responsibly on behalf of the populace, a practice which changed at the end of the 1800s when politicians in Canada adopted, uh, through great turmoil, the American uh, procedure of representative government, which subtly transfers power to the masses. And today, most people s speak of democracy with, with the idea that the people should have a right to be heard. With the entrenchment, however, of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in 1982, a whole new legal picture was drawn in this country. Now the rights of the individual are those limited to what the state decrees them to be. The power of interpretation and amendment of the Charter of Rights no longer rests with Parliament, but like the American system, has been transferred to the judicial arm of government, that is, the court system. The real difference is, is that ideally, uh, speaking and in a, in a broadly, in a broad manner of speaking, uh, Christian men ruled in this country according to conscience, whereas today power is in the hands of a multicultural populace who is able to blackmail and intimidate politicians against traditional Christian values by using the courts against them. That is highly significant. We don't have time to go through the Im immigration and population statistics, but if you look at them, you can see that this too has contributed to the great change in the makeup of Canadian culture in the last 100 years. The point is, from looking at immigration and population statistics, is that 100 years ago, there weren't that many people in Canada, and those that were here were mostly immigrated from the old world with a Christian milieu and background. Today, the former Christian influence has been highly diluted by uh, millions, many millions more people in this country, large numbers of which are undoubtedly irreligious and apathetic, and large numbers of which are non-Christian based on their source of origin. At one time in this country, before the rise of television and VCRs, the main competing influence for the minds of children was radio, um, a little bit of school, what their parents said, and what they got in church, and perhaps the comic books. Today, I read recently somewhere that children, according to the statistics, view more television, than, they spend more time viewing television than they do going to school and getting uh, a, a specific education in this country. We know that Christians are not the people that dominate prime time shows and the things that are appealing to children today for the large part. Who is it that is controlling the minds of young people today? At the turn of the century, another uh, writer has indicated that most people were church-going people. Even if it was just nominal, at least everybody almost went to church. During the 1800s, uh, everybody went to church. It was the thing to do. Earlier than that, over in Europe, everybody discussed theology, like people discuss sports today. Times have really changed. One expert said recently that 3,500 to 4,000 Protestant churches in this country die every year in America, and 80 to 85 cent percent of the churches in America have either plateaued in their growth or are dying. A Gallup poll in 1978 indicated that 41 percent of Americans didn't go to church, and 10 years later that had risen to 44 percent. The point is, is that people are copying other church left and right. Things are no longer the same in this country as they once were. I've, I've cited all of these above examples to give you an indicator as to some of the reasons why our country has changed, and basically to make one main point. We live in a post-Christian era in Canada in the 20th century. We no longer live in a country which necessarily has or likes or defends or cares about Christian values once held dear. I believe that professing Christians and many of the average people on the street in this city 
and in cities like it around Canada are being faced with the need to defend the values that they have long taken for granted. We are having to defend traditions that are being uh, increasingly opposed by a hostile society. For example, as we mentioned a few moments ago, Christian religious education, we've just recently seen in Sault Ste. Marie, is being challenged and defeated by a minority of people wanting multicultural religious teaching. If you broaden that picture out a little bit, New Agers are even writing books and saying things like Christians are really the bigots and the, and the people that are in the way of progress. And it won't be too long before humanism and New Age Hinduism combines to persecute Christianity in this country. Some people scoff at that, but I believe it's coming. At present, and the only thing that will keep that from happening, is that we need to educate people to the real benefits of Christianity that we have in this country. We need to communicate to people that the real value of the Christian heritage is beginning to disappear in this country with the passage of new laws and the striking down of old traditions, and people don't realize what is going to take its place. The whole point, based on the Bible tonight, that's behind this study, is that serving and loving God on the one hand is taught in the Bible and it brings many beneficial effects. When you serve God, you're blessed. And the Bible warns that if you turn away from God, you're cursed whether it's an individual or a group of people or a society, disobedience to God and rejection of the one true God leads to damnation and, and cursing. This is a principle that's not found in merely isolated passages of Scripture. It's found from cover to cover. Let me just remind you of some of the words of Scripture tonight that show us this cause and effect relationship, that yielding to the Word of God and listening to what God has to say here will produce beneficial results, turning away from this and substituting a, a different philosophy or groups of philosophies for the Word of God produces vastly different effects. Listen to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 24. He gives us Jehovah's words, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord our God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Notice those words, that if you keep God's commandments, you will end up having good results. Look at the other side of it. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we read this. The first part of the chapter opens up with the blessing part. It shall come to pass if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee. So positive things will come. On the other hand, verse 15, but it shall come to pass if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come on thee and overtake thee. And you should read Deuteronomy 28 tonight in the quietness of your own bedroom. Get your Bible out, read that chapter, and see what God says will happen to a country or to a nation that turns its back on God. Israel lived in a day when God showered physical blessings and physical curses on them depending upon their obedience or disobedience to him. And today, while I don't believe that all of those things are necessarily going to apply to every other ethnic group, because we don't all as nations today have exactly the same relationship to God as Israel once had, yet in principle the truth still applies. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15, a couple of chapters later, Moses said, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances, 
that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land to which thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare unto you this day that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land to which thou passest over. Historians have documented the fact that many civilizations have risen and fallen. And today there's a swirling controversy over one of the causes. Uh, what causes nations and empires to rise and fall? What caused the Roman Empire to fall? What caused the Inca civilization to fall? And while many people would disagree with it, I believe that basically we have this, that when societies become loose in their morals, when they throw away their original standards, when they become irreligious and polytheistic, you, you have a, a civilization without any boundaries, without anything to prevent it from self-destructing. We are seeing the self-destruction of this culture before our very eyes. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, he said, reiterating the very principles of Moses, only be thou strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. If you want to prosper people, stick to the word of God. Don't deviate from it, even a little bit. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I was reading in the book of Isaiah this morning. I came across a verse that probably puts it plainer than anywhere else that I've seen with a real dire warning to us. Isaiah 5.22, Therefore Jehovah said, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root, and, and in this particular portion of Isaiah, God is referring to Israel who, just like Moses had warned, had turned away from God. And so God says to, to them through their prophet about 700 uh, B.C., so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossoms shall go up as dust. From the root to the blossoms, the whole thing, is going to fall apart. Why? Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. We're seeing the same thing happen in our culture. However, all is not lost. A little bit later, the, the uh, writer says in Second Chronicles chapter 7, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God says, Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their, heal their land. And I could give you examples down through Canadian and American history where there have been revivals in certain places where people turn back to God through the preaching and teachings of the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Jewish and Hebrew uh, and Christian scriptures, and it had dramatic re effects. I heard an Indian uh, evangelist tell me not too long ago of a revival that took place up at Round Lake uh, near the Ontario, Win uh, Ontario Manitoba border. And he says that uh, the whole town came to Jesus Christ through the teaching of missionaries that went up there. And it, it got to the place where they couldn't, where the store, the local store, couldn't get rid of its tobacco and its liquor and had to ship it out by plane. Nobody was buying it anymore. And I know there's people that would wish something like that would happen, and it won't happen unless Christianity gets a foothold anywhere. See, it's the teaching of the Bible that produces converted lives. We're going to talk about some of the specific benefits of Christianity, but the principle is, if you will turn back to God, lives are changed. God will heal the problems that this country has. Listen to Isaiah again, chapter 48, verses 17 and 18. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Redeemer means deliverer and savior, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit. That's his job who leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been like a river, and thy righteousness like the ways of the sea. If you want to have peace, if you want to have righteousness, if you want to have profit, listen to God. That's his job. His job is to teach us and to lead us through life. We don't have the ability to do it ourselves. 
Jesus told the story one time, and his story is recorded in Matthew chapter 7, the last four or five verses of the chapter, about a wise man and a foolish man. And we're all familiar with that, how the wise man built his house on a rock. He founded it just like any builder would, on a solid foundation. The foolish man built his house on the sand. And building your life on some other philosophy other than the revealed word of God is being a foolish person. Jesus started out by saying, Whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. Jesus' word is on a par with Jehovah's word in the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus is Jehovah. A lot of people don't realize that. But if you listen to him, your life will be founded on something worth living for. Listen to this description of our society. It was written 2,000 years ago by a famous missionary by the name of the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 1, verses 28 to 31. Even as people did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That is, a mind that was worth nothing. To do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, insolent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful. And the list goes on. What Paul was describing 2,000 years ago in the first chapter of Romans is like reading today's newspaper. We're going to talk about what happens when you turn away from God. And then I, the last scripture I just want to bring to your attention tonight as a, as a foundation for this business of the benefits of Christianity and uh, of obeying God is Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Be not deceived. And this is from the New Testament. The New Testament meshes perfectly with the Old Testament. Be not deceived. God is not marked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of his flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, Paul advises Christians, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now this is the lead-up to the real thing I was going to talk about in the program tonight. I've been trying to impress upon you that the Bible teaches from cover to cover that if you follow God's way, you'll be blessed. If you're an individual or a nation or a country. If you turn away from God's way and substitute His ideas with somebody else's, you're bound to fail. Let me list for you some of the things that are going to disappear from Canadian culture as Christianity is more and more rejected. Number one, love and tolerance for other people with differing viewpoints. It is Christianity that teaches love even for one's enemies based on the absolutes of Scripture. It was a Christian society that provided for the freedom of conscience that up until recently we all took for granted. With the increasing babble of voices today, we are seeing the rise of militants, bigotry, and intolerance since the unwritten rule now governing social values is the law of the jungle survival of the fittest and most powerful. It's only God that tells us, love your enemy. And if you wipe God out of the picture, well, then you do what you want to do. And that's what we're seeing. Something else that's going to disappear from Canadian culture is clarity and consistency in law and justice. It was a Christian orientation of law that was united by its dependence on the absolutes of the Bible, once again, that was behind the old legal foundations in this country. With the current relative values of right and wrong, combined with the reality of power politics, there is absolutely no possible way that laws in the future are going to be consistent, nor are they going to be consistently enforced. A third thing that is very much at stake and that is going downhill in this culture is respect for authority. It is the Bible that teaches us to respect our spouses. It is the Bible that teaches children to obey their parents. It is the Bible that tells students to respect their teachers. 
and that people should respect their church leaders and that citizens should honor and show custom to whom custom and fear to whom fear and respect for government leaders. But with the prevailing rejection of the Christian scriptures today, we see an alarming loss of respect for authority in all of these categories. This is only to be expected in a society based on evolutionary or nihilistic philosophy where violence is either required or inevitable. If there is no God, like so many people are advocating, if we're here by chance, or if there are so many gods that it doesn't really matter, then there is no basis for, really, no rational, consistent basis for putting down violence. In fact, according to evolution, violence is absolutely required. What you're going to see is people committing suicide in larger numbers. One of the things that we have gotten as a heritage from Christianity in, in our society is a general confidence in the future. While Christians aren't alone in believing in the sovereignty of God, and by sovereignty I mean that God has a plan, an all overarching plan for the world and time in which he is solely responsible and capable and working out. While Christians aren't the only people that believe in the sovereignty of God, it is a fact that true hope and assurance ultimately can only rest on the wisdom and power of God who has a sovereign plan for man. Today, people are putting their confidence in science and technology. This is where it's at in many people's eyes. But there have been too many examples of men's latent inability to properly control and channel science and technology for good instead of evil to give any thinking person lasting confidence in science and technology alone. A fifth thing that is going to disappear from Canadian culture is true character rehabilitation. The Bible uses the word conversion to describe it. Only the indwelling spirit of God and the Son of God are able to create in a depraved person a new mind and a new heart. It is Christianity alone that holds the key to true rehabilitation of sinners so that drunks and prostitutes and gamblers and liars and thieves and murderers become profitable citizens in society. The utter failure of the humanistic attempts to rehabilitize to rehabilitate through mere education or behavioral programs or, or psychotherapy or social programming will only get worse as men continue in their own experiments to try to change criminals into productive citizens. It doesn't work. Just last week, I saw a, a video put out by a group of people giving that, that interviewed inmates in San Quentin Prison down in California. And many of these men had come to Jesus Christ. And these men, with one accord, there were a dozen men that give their testimony in this video, said that the, what Jesus Christ did for them was change them from the inside out. He healed their brains. And only Christ can heal your brain and make you think right. A lot of other groups can alter your consciousness and alter your thinking, but they won't make you better people. Something else that is based on Christianity is rational and critical thinking. In spite of what the media would have you believe about fundamentalists as bigots and, and no minds today, it is Christianity alone that introduces people to making real world distinctions. And we are seeing people turn away from this by the thousands today, embracing Eastern philosophy, Hindu philosophy, which denies any real world distinctions, which can make absurd statements like, you are me and we are all one and we are trees and, and everything else. It doesn't make sense. Christianity makes real-world distinctions. Christianity operates on the basis of cause and effect. It is Christianity that cautions people with the need for making legitimate assumptions before they wholeheartedly embrace a philosophy. It is Christianity that warns against mindlessly and blindly following other people, even if they're in the majority. But with the rejection of Christianity, we see the rise of mysticism today, the rise of spiritualism and occultism, we see the frightening increase in bizarre, mind-controlling techniques and practices of the cults, and less and less rational thinking by a public that seems to be easily swayed and manipulated by peer pressure and packaged pro programming, especially by many groups in the media. A seventh characteristic of blessing that we take for granted in this culture that is going to die off as Christianity is rejected more and more is a personal sense of responsibility and a sense of accountability. 
It is Christianity that teaches that every man will stand before God and answer for what he has or has not done. God holds man accountable to all levels of authority, whether it be politics or laws or economics or society in general. Only on this basis have laws and justice any meaning at all. When people are raised without this kind of thinking, then we see escapism and irrationality and anarchy eroding the systems of law and justice and economic responsibility. We see people adopting ethics, which are really non-ethics in, in, in the world of economics. Something else that is based on Christianity, I believe, and that is balance. Balance. The God of Christianity, which has revealed himself in the Bible, ha is a person with complex character. God is, at the same time, holy and yet gracious. He is three, and yet he is one. He is in control of everything that happens in this world, according to the Bible, and yet we see down here real and operative human will. We see grace versus law. We see uh, the natural desire for personal gratification in all human beings that God has made, yet God has said, this will happen. And when people are trained in the Bible, when they are introduced to a God that has this complex world and, and scheme of things, it teaches people to learn balance in their outlook on life. Lacking this understanding, people tend to become self-centered, self-absorbed, narrow-minded, bigoted, and uncaring about other people. Add to this the fact that only Christianity produces a heightened and sensitive conscience in its converts, which is ultimately the only subjective basis for balanced thoughts and deeds. A non-Christian culture, and I repeat, a non-Christian culture lacks conscience and thus the ability to maintain necessary balances. And last but not least, one of the great benefits of Christianity is that it teaches people to have a concerned support for good government. Not only does Christianity teach that people should respect authority, but it teaches responsibility to support and honor and pray for good government. It is Christianity which provides the only sound basis for judging the legitimacy of government. By teaching all men everywhere that legitimate government is defined by and recognized by its adoption of laws which are in harmony with the already revealed laws of God, the laws found in Scripture. When laws of God conflict with laws of men, the Bible plainly teaches that God's laws should take supremacy. But when people do not know this, then they do not act upon it, and then government is easily perverted into calling that good which is really evil and vice versa. That very thing comes out of Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Without a Christian populace, the fundamental and necessary checks and balances on government are lost to the caprice and lusts of men acting in the interest of the strongest bidder. What we've been trying to say in this program tonight is that Christianity has and can continue to produce its beneficial fruits in society. But if the foundations of Christianity are removed, if the populace and government are allowed to swallow the lie that Christianity is of no value, these fruits that we've been talking about in the program tonight are going to be replaced by other fruits tasting far less palatable to peace-loving and reasonable men. What Jesus said of false prophets in Matthew chapter 7 could just as truly be said of political sciences. By their fruits, you should know them. What does a person do? My advice to you tonight is that if you're not a Christian, you've been missing out on the individual blessings that can come to you through having a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. And it is a person like that that seeks the truth in the Word of God, that knows how wretched and poor they are, that knows that there is no good thing in them, that they need to cast themselves 
totally in dependence on the finished work of Jesus Christ, who came into the world 2,000 years ago and took your punishment and mine on that Roman cross. They nailed him to the cross for unjust charges. He did nothing wrong. But the Bible says that, that the Son of God took the, sons, the sins of the sons of men on him. The righteous became unrighteous so that the sinner could come to God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, therefore, and thou shalt be saved. He's our link to eternal blessing. But the next thing you can do, if you're a Christian already, is do exactly what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. Pray for everybody in authority, the mayor, the alderman, the people in Queens Park, the people in Ottawa. Pray for these people and pray that God would allow us to continue to live a life in this country characterized by peace and freedom. We better pray that they do not reject Christianity and replace it with humanistic laws and other things that are completely different in foundations than that which the society was based on. Because if they do, our society and culture is going to change like, it's never been, like we've never seen it before. People, we have the freedom to speak out in this country. Make your voice known. Support groups like Citizens for Christian Values that meets in this locality on a regular basis. Whatever you do, do what the Bible says. Continue in that which you have learned. Christians have no right to jump off and become extremists. We're to love everyone, regardless of how much we differ from them. So I hope that you'll begin to realize that Christianity has great things going for it that many times are overlooked, and it comes from the Bible. Thank you.
evening. We're indeed delighted to be able to come and share with you once again the Word of the Lord. I'm Dr. Clark, the host of this portion of the Way of Life program, and we invite you to take your Bibles now in view of the burden which is before us, a lot of the great, great Christian heritage which is ours. And you know, folks, we do have a rich heritage. It is just marvelous that we live in this great, great land of ours that has uh, a wonderful, wonderful background in light of its spiritual emphasis, in light of its spiritual birth, so to speak. We are a nation that can be easily proven, historically speaking, that we are a Christian nation. At least we have been. And I believe we have before us a great challenge these days for those of us who know the Lord as our Savior to be living for our Lord, to be encouraging others to be living for the Lord in light of the Word of God. And my burden with you this afternoon is to share with you a biblical emphasis for our rich Christian heritage. And one of the reasons that I'm doing this is because I have recently read an article in our local paper where we've had that expressed by a writer that the heritage of the Christian belief should be considered just simply one among many and that as far as the spiritual life is concerned it is simply a matter of the mind. Folks, that's as far from the truth as anything could be. I want you to take your Bibles with me and turn to John chapter 14. And I want to read for you these few verses and spend just a little time with you because of the nature of this ministry. The way of life program above everything else is dedicated to bringing to you the truth of the Word of God which gives to us the revelation of life, true life, the truth for spiritual life. And it's not one among many, but it is the way of life. Let's read John chapter 14. The first six verses. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking these words. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me make one more reference, may I, to this article that I read in our local paper where you have so-called Christianity, simply one among many of the equals along with Christianity. This article endeavored to prove how that even the Lord Jesus would sit down and gain and converse with other religions of the world, particularly if he were alive today. And there was an endeavor to prove such a position by a quotation from the word of the Lord. Let me remind you at this very moment, to quote from the Bible is no proof that the writer is giving you the truth. 
May I remind you in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew where the Lord Jesus was taken by Satan out on the mount and to be tempted that Satan himself quoted Scripture. Now we're reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, do not be surprised that if Satan's own ministers transform themselves into angels of light endeavoring to give a spiritual message which is true. And we have so many, many false religions today that will appeal to the Bible to help support the validity for their erroneous doctrine and way of spiritual life, so to speak. Now, this passage in John chapter 14, if you'll just simply listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ has to say in answer to the question of Thomas, he said, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know that way. Well, he's just told them that he's going to be with his Father in the heavenlies, and he's going to be preparing a place for his believers, not only those who believe in the Father, but believe in him. And then he's going to come back to gather them to himself and take them to that place that has been prepared in the heavenlies for all believers in the Lord Jesus. And so in answer to that question, he emphasizes something. And he said, listen, Thomas, he said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, from the original language, this is how it should be understood. And I'm giving to you that which is the Greek New Testament, the original language of the New Testament of our Bible. It's this. I am the way. Now, that way is characterized by two things. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way that the Lord Jesus is speaking about as far as entrance into the heavenlies is the way of the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus alone. No other religions, no other ways. The Lord Jesus further stated previously in the Gospel of John, stating, I am the door. I am the way. No man can come to the Father except by me. All that ever came before me, all others are those that are not true. Thieves, liars, robbers are the words from the lips of the Lord Jesus. And in this passage, which is the theme of the Way of Life program, he says, listen, the way that I am to the Father and I am the way it is the truth. The truth. Let it sink, folks. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through the person of Jesus Christ. It is the true way. Now then he goes on to say, that way is the way of life. Previously in the Gospel of John, the Lord Jesus said this to individuals, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, they are they which testify of me, but you won't come to me. That you might have life. Dear people, Christianity, salvation in Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Christianity is not one among many religions that's going to heaven. Absolutely not. The only true way to get to heaven, my friend, is by Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for your sin, was buried and rose again. He is the way of life. He is the way that's true. And he further says, no one, absolutely no one is going to come to the Father 
except by me. That's pretty straight, isn't it? That's pretty clear. You don't have to be led into deception. You don't have to be led into error because the Bible states there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the person of Jesus Christ. He claims to be the only way. He stated it here in clear, simple language. And oh, dear Father, uh, dear folks, won't you come to the Father by trusting in a person whose name is Jesus, the Son of God, who died at Calvary, as many as received him. The Father said he gives them the right to become the children of God, to those that believe in his name. And to believe doesn't mean to just lip it. It means to trust in the heart and trust only in Jesus as your Savior. Won't you do that and live and enter heaven in the presence of the Father? Please do. This has been a production of Northland Bible College located in Gooley River. With other Bible-believing Christians, we are concerned with spreading the good news of the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ and with helping true believers grow in their relationship with Him. We trust you enjoyed this type of Bible teaching and quarterly invite your questions or comments. Audio cassettes of today's program are available at the nominal cost of $2. When ordering, include the date of the program. Write to Northland Bible College, RR number 2, Gooley River, Ontario, POS 1EO. And don't forget what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me.